Welcome to episode number 25 of the Animals at Home podcast. It's hard to believe that I've already recorded 25 episodes. Each episode is sort of an immense amount of work. I shouldn't say immense, but I I probably spend anywhere from 15 to 25 hours on each episode. So depending on how much research I do prior or how much editing is required, depending on the episode, sometimes I'll spend over 20 hours a week or 20 hours per episode. So that's 20 hours over two weeks producing the show. But having said that, I really have enjoyed it. And I'm for one, there's a selfish side. I love chatting with my guests. That's a great part of this project that I'm working on. I get to talk with very, very cool, interesting, interesting and fascinating people. But two, I wouldn't be doing all of that work if it wasn't for you guys listening to the show. So I really appreciate the listener base that I have. Thank you so much for tuning in every second week. I really, really appreciate it. And if you are enjoying the show, one great way you can show your appreciation is just by going to iTunes or the podcasting app on your Apple device and and hitting the five star rating. If if you do that, that really, really does help me out a lot. I I really, really appreciate it if you do. And it makes the show more visible in the Apple store or in the podcasting app. The more ratings we get, the more listeners we get, and the larger the show is going to grow, which is going to be great for me and great for you, of course, as well. One last housekeeping thing before we get on to today's episode. Over the past few weeks, I've been in communications with a company called CustomReptileHabitats.com. You can check them out online. I'll post a link in the show notes. This company is determined to sort of pull all of the best and highest quality reptile products, their care and husbandry products together into one website that you can view and order what you need. And of course, with my philosophy, you guys know that it's all about increasing care, all about increase. Everybody should be striving to slowly grow their level of care over time. And this is a company that's really doing that. That's part of the reason that we've been in communication because it fits well with the philosophy that I have. So one of the things that they've recently done is put together a really, really cool decor kit. It's called the Rocky Canyon Decor Kit. So it's designed for a three-foot cage. So it comes with a really, really nice three foot, 3D background, nice rocks, crevices, ledges. It comes with two separate ledges, six artificial rocks, nine artificial plants, two water bowls, some silicone to help you glue everything down. It's a really, really cool package. There's also an option to add an artificial basking log. Really, really nice stuff. The, The price starts at 159 depending on what options you go with. And if you use the coupon code animals at home, a free bag of sphagnum moss will also be thrown in with the order. So this is a price that's only going to last. I believe it's a special that's only going to about July 4th. So if you are looking for some really, really nice decor at a really affordable price, I mean, there's no, you, you probably couldn't even find a background for $159, let alone all the other stuff that's being thrown into this package. So if you are in the market for maybe a leopard gecko enclosure or something, this is definitely where you want to take a look. All of that will be in the show notes as well. This week I am chatting with Mariah Healy of Reptifiles. So Reptifiles is a fantastic resource for reptile care. So part of Mariah's goal was to establish really good, high quality, well detailed reptile care guides. And there's a lot of other stuff on Reptifiles.com as well, but we specifically discussed the care guides. And obviously you guys know that I talk about this all the time. The care and husbandry quality of the hobby is sort of dicey. Some people are very good and there's a lot of people that you know aren't really sure what they're doing. There's a lot of impulse purchasing and whatnot. And I think Mariah is really, really striving to help correct this issue. And we don't have an authority sort of place to go for good quality information in the reptile hobby. For some reason, we have lots of different outlets, people who are really good at you know one specific species and whatnot. But we haven't had someone pull it all together in an environment that's trustworthy. And that's exactly what Reptifiles is. So it, it was this was a fantastic conversation and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So here's my conversation with Mariah. All right. Well, Mariah, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, I'm very excited to chat with you. You're uh, one of those interesting individuals who's attempting to solve what I think is one of the worst issues in the 21st century, which is misinformation on the internet. And obviously that plagues everywhere, not just the reptile hobby. And uh, But but specifically, obviously, there, there's some major issues in that area with the reptile hobby. And we don't really have an authority site or an authority location for good information. And it's great to chat with somebody who's working on that. So, so I think we can have a great conversation surrounding that. What got you into the hobby? What's your story? How did you, how did you get here? 
So it's not really the same as most people uh, for reptiles. I've definitely always had an interest in reptiles ever since I was a little kid. Um, one of my earliest experiences, I think, with reptiles was uh, when I was like three years old, and my parents took me to one of those prehistoric pets shows, and I got to pet a Nile monitor, and that was really cool. Um, got pictures. My parents sent one to me a while ago, and I kind of freaked out a little. Uh, also, my we had a family friend. She was uh, my pediatrician, actually, and she had her own zoo basically in her house. I mean, she just had everything and it was a kid, an animal loving kids paradise. Um, and so I think between early exposure to reptiles and, uh, early exposure to people who have their own collection of exotic animals, um, has just kind of helped shape me into this person where I love animals, and I think that reptiles are some of the most interesting ones out there. What sort of animals did the pediatrician have? Oh, man, let's see. I was so little that most of it just looked cool, and I couldn't identify it, you know? Right. Um, the ones I do remember, like, she had normal, like, pond sliders, but she also had a sandfish, I'm pretty sure, and his name was Wink, Wink the Skink. <laughs> He'd like poke in the sand with a pencil to find him. And there was also an African lungfish named Louie. Oh, cool. And that was, he was pretty awesome. And I still freak out a little bit to this day whenever I see a lungfish. I'm like, oh my gosh, I know what that is. They're really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it definitely requires exposure at a young age. And I, th I think there's that, there's actually a picture of you as a, a young child with that now monitor on your website, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I use it on the About page. Yeah, yeah. So it's very cool. And and especially when you can get kids involved at a young age, that the sort of fear, they don't develop it. You know, they just, everybody thinks reptiles are cool when you're a kid. And they sort of, you eventually lose that, I think. Totally. It's it's definitely social conditioning. In fact, my um, I just had a very direct experience with this with my niece the other day when she came to visit. And my sister is not the biggest fan of reptiles. Um, she's really afraid of bugs. And uh, so, but she's been really good about helping her daughter be more open-minded. And it helps that her daughter has already graduated, or what's the word for it? Uh, gravitated, that's it. Um, gravitated towards snakes um, when they go to zoos and aquariums. Like though, that's something she really wants to see. And she actually texted me a while back and she's like, hey, weird request. Uh, can you send me snake videos of your snakes that I can show her when she goes to bed? So she gets snake videos for bedtime stories. That's which is amazing. Great. And she, when they visited, um, one, I gave her a plush, like five foot long ball python. It was amazing, and she takes it everywhere, and it's now called Sneaker, because the name for our ball python is Sneaker. And uh, she went right for the snakes in our reptile room, but she actually had this fear of lizards that I did not expect. She was okay with the smooth scales of the snake and no legs and all that, but for some reason, the rough scales and four legs of my bearded dragon really freaked her out. And so it, it took a little bit because she was more okay with our blue tongue skinks, which look a lot more snake-like. But the more lizard-like the animal looked, the more freaked out she was. And so we had to work with her for about an hour before she was comfortable with just like petting. And it was a very interesting experience seeing how... Uh, familiarity and the way that the people around you react um, can influence how you react to things, especially when you're just so young and impressionable. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's like uh, the kid learns how to react based off how their parents react. And that sort of sets in stone how they're going to think of this animal. And, you know, and, and lizards tend to move a lot faster. So some people are more afraid of them too, right? Because they're kind of skittery. And but you must be the coolest aunt then for this, for your niece. I am winning major ant points. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that that's going to be a, a great relationship, I'm sure. So, what what was the first animal you got, or that you sort of got you into the hobby on a on a hobby basis? Um. So casually, I had several reptiles growing up. Getting into the hobby, the first animal I had was a bearded dragon. Pretty pretty classic story there. Um. 
And it was actually two because very, I made so many beginner state mistakes. Uh, even though I am fairly good at research and I did a lot of reading, you know, there's, there's still that mentality of, I want to do what I want to do rather than I need to do what's best for the animal and also restrictions of budget. Me and my husband were both in college at the time and restrictions of, uh, well, when, when you get a family pet, you need to accommodate the wants of both people in the relationship or everyone in the family. And so while I wanted one, well, this is a very common problem actually. I wanted one, my husband wanted the other, we ended up getting both and co-having them in a 90 gallon tank, which is better than a 40, but still uh, not optimal. And I think we had like some shelf liner and a branch and no, we didn't even have the hammock, like shelf liner, a branch, maybe a rock <laughs> and the UVB um, and a non-reflective fixture and a heat lamp. And that was about it for equipment. Um, it was very basic, and fortunately, uh, one of them is still with us. I think the other, the other died of unknown causes uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, but those, those are the ones that really got me started in the hobby. And as I, and that was around the time too that I was starting out in my job as a digital marketer. And one of the things that the company I was working for did uh, was they gave their employees sandbox sites to kind of learn how internet copy works and how SEO works. So I dove in and my sister is a food blogger. She's the food right, if anyone's interested. And she, um, and I really admired the way that she was doing it. Her pictures were so pretty, her stories were funny. And I'm like, gee, I'm good at writing on paper and essays, but I'm not very good at writing on the internet. So I thought I'd give it a shot. I experimented with food blogging. I experimented with um, like geek blogging, like uh, cosplay and Comic Con stuff, uh, tips, because that's a hobby of mine. Um, all kinds of things. It just ranged all over the board. And when I got my Bearded Dragons, I realized in, over the course of my research that there was not a lot of information or there was a lot of information, but it was hard to figure out what was accurate. And I had to read so many sources. There was no one source that was comprehensive and well organized enough to really satisfy me. Um, and books are notoriously out of date in most cases, just because by the time it's published, something's changed. So I decided to put my findings on my little website called littlebitofeverythingplease.com which I think has been bought by someone in a different country by now. And it just, it, it just sat there. It really wasn't anything impressive. Um, and if anything, it was a resource that I could look up on my phone whenever I needed to double check my research and wanted like temperatures or what bulb to buy or et cetera. And that made things easier, but of course, the reptile hobby is addicting. <laughs> and so uh, we got a blue tongue skink, we got a doom rolls boa. And as I did research on those species, I started uh, putting my research for them on the website as well. And around that time, I was also writing weekly blog posts about everything under the sun uh, to do with reptile care. And I am amazed. I used to be able to do it in one hour a week. That is not the case anymore. Because <laughs> um, I got my, like, I would be paid by the company to go play on your sandbox site for an hour a week. And I'm like, sweet. Uh, it was a good opportunity. I wrote a lot of weird stuff. Like, I tried experimenting with humor. I'm not a comedian. <laughs> um and so it just kind of slowly expanded its reach and grew a tiny bit. Um, and eventually it got to the point where I had left the original company. Um, I needed to a new site. And so I picked a name, which took a long time. Reptifiles, combination of reptile and files and just smushed them together. And I really, really didn't want to do like 
herptophiles or something like that because don't google that it's terrible (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh and it just worked uh i was really worried at first about losing my traffic because i think i was at like a thousand views a day by the time that happened and now i'm at like in it i did lose a lot of traffic and i was heartbroken but now because i have an actual brand associated with it and i've Ever since I actually gave it a name, it's become much more of a of a small business project. Not much of a side project or a hobby anymore. I'm more of an all-encompassing beast um, that has or passion that has taken over my life since then. And it's just grown like crazy. And I'm at about twenty five hundred views a day now. Wow, that's very impressive. And uh, so it's it's just interesting that it was kind of an organic start and. Well, I know Google really loves sort of authority style websites like your your site now. They, they they're really pumping that up through the the SEO side of things. So, and it's good because sites like yours, you know that the person writing it had to put a lot of work into creating it and and it's nice to see that Google's actually, you know, pump, bumping those up the ranking. So that's really cool. Was there was there a moment that you were that you were like, "Wow, there's there's really bad information or almost too much information, so I I should really promote this stuff and, and do do my best to to write better care or was it just because you were just kind of playing around in, in, in the sandbox site and, and it just sort of grew into what it is now or was there something that you saw or or, or experienced that you realized wow care is really horrible in the hobby and, and there's something that needs to be done I can't really say that there was any one particular moment of realization. I really, this whole process has been very gradual for me. It's not like a lot of people who say, then one day it just all became clear. And I knew that I had found my life calling. Like I've never had that aha moment. Um, And it just, I think it's come as a product of, with all the research that I've done, I've seen good information and I've seen bad information. I've seen stuff that most of the time is partly right, um, while the rest of the information is outdated. Um, And I've seen a lot of arguments on forums, on Facebook groups, a lot of folklore husbandry going around, and a lot of people saying, man, it is so hard to find somewhere I can trust. And I think that right there, that sentiment is what I'm really going for, is I want to be that source that if people only find reptophiles and they don't read anything else, at least their animal won't be hurt. It's always better to talk to other keepers, to do your own research, to expand your expertise, But the fact of the matter is a lot of people want a pet. They don't want to become an expert on their pet. And this applies to exotic animals as well as it does dogs. So if I can be that all-in-one resource that they use as their reptile Bible, then that's my goal. And that would make the hobby so much better. Totally agree. And it is so bizarre that up until this point, we haven't had a really good authority place to go to for care that, that covers many different species. Of course, like you said, there's lots of books and, and there are certain places you can go for species specific stuff, but you guys do cover quite a few species. And so for anyone listening that's not familiar with, with your website, it, it's really detailed and, and well written care guides for the most part. You have lots of other stuff as well that we'll, we'll chat about, but it's the care guides specifically that I think are going to you know, are a game changer in a way. Um, And the arguments online are just bizarre, right? There's, there's stuff of every color everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really amazing. I moderate uh, Bearded Dragons Network. And that is definitely one of the best Bearded Dragon care groups out there. And even then, I sometimes have a slight disagreements with the admins, um, but not often. We're usually on the same page. But compared to what other groups are saying, people are like, yeah, I'm part of four different bearded dragon groups. So why is it that you guys are different when everyone else is saying this? Like 40 gallon is the way to go. You don't need anything bigger than a 40 gallon. It's like, actually, no, you need a 120 gallon, four by two by two minimum for keeping an adult bearded dragon happy. Like it's stuff like that. 
that you just find. And there's so much. And often, the more common an animal is, the more folklore husbandry and myths you get. Yes. The less common, you get a lot of people who don't know what they're doing, and the animal often dies, but you get people who know what they're doing. You don't have any folklore husbandry resources, resources so you have to dig into like the field guides and the research papers and the people who have successfully bred them and used them as your baseline. And it makes my job a lot easier as a researcher because there's so much less to sift through. Totally. Yeah. And it's, there's a, a, a few things. One, some of these animals are so rugged, they can really be put up with the worst care for so many years that it's actually difficult to tell like, wow, am I doing a bad job or not? Like they, they can actually, you won't, I wouldn't say thrive, but they can survive with horrendous conditions, which is kind of a, a downside to some, some reptiles like a bearded dragon. It's amazing what they can be, you know, sort of put up with. And I, I'm still not totally convinced that Facebook is a net positive for the hobby for th those exact reasons, because there are so many myths that get perpetuated through, through the, all over Facebook slash if there's a newcomer to Facebook, typically they get completely, you know, shut down immediately if they've made a mistake. So it, I, I think care needs to be moved off Facebook, you know? You know what? You totally have a point there. I think it is important for reptile keepers to be able to talk to each other. And Facebook is the first resource that most new owners go to. They say, oh, I got a pet bearded dragon. They don't Google bearded dragon care. They go to Facebook and they Google bearded dragon group. Because, Google, search, eh, same thing. Um, and it's... It's really interesting how people will trust a face rather than just words on a page. And that's why one of the reasons why YouTube is so successful right now is people want human contact. They crave it, especially now in our society. And they're so much more likely to trust another person, even if it's just, you know, like a review on a review site someone with a name, somebody with a voice that doesn't sound like advertising propaganda, they're going to trust that leaves and bounds above anything else. And I find that often what I have to do to promote reptophiles is I have to say, hey, as a fellow reptile keeper, this is the resource that I use when I need information about my reptiles. And people are like, oh, thanks. They might see it on Google, they might see it in the search engine results page, but at the end of the day, they want that human contact. And so I don't think we'll ever be able to really get rid of Facebook groups. And I don't think necessarily we should, but we definitely need to cut down on the folklore husbandry and uh, achieve a common consensus. There's a lot of different ways that you can care for a reptile. True, there's a lot of room for variation. And they are hardy. But we need to stop saying, my reptile lived this many years and it was just fine. It's like, just fine isn't good enough. We need a standard. We need a unified uh, set of rules. I don't know if this would take an international organization or government interference or who knows what. Uh, Europe has some interesting standards that um, are fun to look at if anyone's ever interested. But it's it's a it's a positive and a negative and i think what it really comes down to is the people who know what they're talking about need to be vocal it's so easy to get tired of answering those questions and just letting other people take it but it's often the people with the least amount of knowledge are going to answer the most and the people with the most knowledge answer the least because they're tired of answering the same dang questions over and over and over again. But we can't afford to get tired. We have to put the information out there as this is the accurate information. This is what you need to trust. And hopefully by creating at least some kind of foundation and bedrock for this still very new and very fluid uh, hobby, we can at least start improving things from the ground up. Totally. Yeah. And it is quite new. And, you know, it, it, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dunning Kruger effect, but it's this, this 
thing that happens to people where the less experience you have in a domain, the more confident you are that you know what you're talking about is. So it's exactly that. Like people, you, as you start to learn more, you realize, wow, maybe I, you know, there's so much variables here. It's hard to answer a question, but you know, someone that's had a bearded dragon for a week thinks that they're, you have a PhD in bearded dragon studies or something. So, so tell me about the, uh, the process that you use to write the care guides. Like wh- how do you, how do you find the information that you put into them? Oh uh, boy. So (laughs) is that a whole other podcast? (laughs) (laughs) Not really. It's just, it's a complicated and kind of aggravating process sometimes. Uh, Right now I'm working on red eared slider research and to, to be perfectly honest, I have been putting it off. (laughs) Kernels are not my area of expertise and there's so much information on red eared sliders. So much. So I've got this list like, this long of 12 point resource links that I've written down that I've got to look through and take notes on. And I'm just like, please no. (laughs) Um, So to be more specific, aside from me just being like, I feel like I'm being crushed. um, I usually start with an outline. Every Reptiles Care Guide has a very specific structure. I go from basic species information at the beginning about where they live, uh, basic life expectancy, are they an omnivore, are they a carnivore, are they an herbivore, Um, and the others, which there are so many. And all of that basic data that just gives you a general idea of what this animal is and how it interacts with its natural environment. And then we go into the specifics. Okay, if we're dealing with an animal that more than one species exists in the hobby. So if we're dealing with a genus like blue tongue skinks, Taliqua, uh, I will include a page on differentiating between the different species. So you know what species you have. Uh, For genera like uh, blue tongue skinks or Taliqua and and leaf-tailed geckos, you're a platus, that's very important to the care of the animal. Then you have, um, after that, I will go into basics of enclosure size. And usually a quick note on whether or not it's okay to cohab the reptiles. Spoiler alert, nine, 19 out of 20 times, it's not okay to cohab the reptiles. 99 out of 100. Um, then after enclosure size discussion, I talk about temperatures, lighting, usually UVB, and then humidity. I, those usually take one to two pages depending on how broad the subject is. Sandfish skinks, one page. Uh, boas, definitely two. The more extensive the humidity needs, usually the more I have to separate that into a separate page. Then there, uh, let's see, temperatures, humidity, lighting. Uh, after that, I will talk about substrate as the next, I kind of go from the inside of the enclosure out. Uh, substrate, really quick discussion. What beddings are good, what beddings are bad, what beddings are best, um, which is usually because there's that gradient, you know, there's like the really good stuff that you should be using that best mimics the natural environment. Then the average stuff like paper towels that like, eh, it works, but it's dumb. <laughs> and then the stuff that is actually a danger to the animal self. Um, after substrate, talk about food, what to feed your animal. That is one of my favorite things to talk about. I love nutrition. I think it's very interesting. It's a foundational part of reptile keeping. And since we often don't have ready-made diets, like dog food is like, okay, here's your kibble. We're good to go. We have to custom make their diets. And that's confusing for a lot of people. They have no idea. Most of these people don't even know what, how to eat for themselves. They don't know the basics of human nutrition. So reptile nutrition is just another planet. Yeah. Um, so breaking that down, giving them admittedly a lot of information, there's no way to condense it um, on the specifics of, okay, what type of, like, what type of eater are they? Where are they in the food chain? How do we meet those needs? Do they need whole food? Do they need uh, like insects versus meat? Savannah monitors are a good example of combating uh, common misconceptions about them. They much they do much better on an insect-based diet than a meat-based diet. Um, and then, okay, so what types of foods are okay? Like not just the general, but like what can I go to the grocery store or the pet store and buy for my animal? 
like, can I use superworms or can I, or should I use crickets? Crickets all the time. Superworms are a treat in most cases. Um, and then also supplementing. Supplementing is a huge part of the nutrition uh, section. And honestly, it keeps getting bigger. It's complicated and if you and it's very easy to do wrong. And when you do it wrong, you really endanger the life of your pet. So I'm constantly refining and tweaking the supplementing standards for reptiles. And the thing is, some need more supplementation than others, even within different, like individual species or subspecies within genre, you see individual fluctuations in tolerance based on how nutrient rich their environment is, which is really interesting. Um, after nutrition, talk about the, let's see. I can write this down in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, after nutrition, I usually talk about handling. Everyone wants to know handling. Uh, so some basic handling tips, how to tame down your reptile, whether or not it is a good idea to handle your reptile. Some are just not handleable. Um, snakes, this section is usually longer because they have to go into safety. Um, for example, Large snakes, uh, anything larger than, say, a boa constrictor constrictor, you get to see issues with wrapping around the neck. Um, you can get, uh, you can suffocate to death or rather strangled to death if you get pressure on your carotid arteries. A lot of people don't realize this. It's something even as small as a large ball python, get the right amount of pressure on your neck and suddenly you start feeling dizzy. <laughs> Large? Okay, I've got a three-foot ball python, and I have to be careful with her around my neck because right now she's not quite big enough, but every once in a while I'll drape her around my shoulders and I have to put my hand up because I'm starting to feel a little bit dizzy. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to put someone to sleep like that, you know? Like mm -hmm. pe pe People in, this, in the reptile hobby often forget, but you just look up videos of kids messing around and giving each other like chokeholds. It takes like 10 seconds to put someone to sleep and it can be really, and it's not the snake being aggressive, obviously, they're just holding on. Yeah. You don't, uh, in movies, which are usually a terrible reference for just about everything, um, you don't see people, when they get choked out, you think it's because they lose their air supply. No, it's because they lose their blood supply That's to the right. brain. Air supply takes a while to choke somebody out. Blood supply takes 30 seconds at max. So... It is a issue that isn't talked about enough among snake peepers, and so I take it all myself to address that issue with the larger snake species addressed on reptophiles is, hey, this is a great pet. However, there are some things you need to know. Um, and that's not exactly a popular topic. I have a rant on um, why large snakes are dangerous pets, and I haven't published it yet because it's highly highly controversial and i don't want PETA getting a hold of it right fair enough which would cause big problems maybe one day if i can team up with usark i can do something about it um but for now i don't think the reptile world and uh, with our current political climate is quite ready for it sure after the handling discussion back on topic tangents so easy um, tangents are great <laughs> uh after the handling discussion i will go into health there's not a lot of health information about reptiles unless you want to crack open a veterinary manual. Um, I'm totally going to read a couple. I've got a couple on my list. I just need to ante up the money. Those are not cheap books. No. But there's so much good information. I love talking to my vets and being like, okay, give me the specifics. What exactly is going on here? Because I've, I used to be a pre-med student in college, and um, I learned a lot about the human body. Animals are generally not that different from each other. Um, there are the levels. I mean, it's definitely reptile physiology is definitely different and more basic compared to mammalian physiology, but there's still similarities. And a lot of the, the basic metabolic processes are the same. Um, so it's really fun to learn about for me. And I love to help people, if not self-diagnose, at least get an idea of what is going on with their animal and whether they should be concerned about it. So 
even though it is not my favorite to write because often I'm writing the same thing for the same care guide or for different care guides over and over and over again, this is very important information for the people who are like, my reptile is doing something out of the norm. I'm freaking out. What are the symptoms? Like, what are the options for what could be going on? And do I need to take my animal to the vet? 75% of the time, yes. Um, <laughs> we should not be attempting to self-treat. Um, and essential oils are a really bad idea. <laughs> um, fortunately, I've not seen those with reptiles too often. The, um, and then the final thing is the additional resources section, which I'm actually trying to beef up a little bit. Um, it is basically a list of the best sources that I used in the care guide, as well as additional sources that people can read on their own if they would like more information. In my Crested Gecko Care Guide, I, oh, I think they're called Moon Valley Geckos. They have a really excellent website I, that I heavily relied on for creating my own Crested Gecko Care Guide, and they really go more into depth than Reptophiles is at liberty to do on everything to do with Crested Geckos. And so I put them in the resources list. Um, sandfish skink. There's lots of research studies on sandfish skinks because they're fascinating little animals. So I list all of those research studies in the research papers section of the additional sources page so that people can go to the source. And as we'll know that I'm not just making this stuff up, it is substantiated by other evidence. I can't cite all of my sources because a lot of it actually does come from forums and Facebook pages. And I can't say, well, it's one random individual who's a breeder said it. I can't exactly cite very well as, as well as I'd like, but I can at least put down the best sources that I found and be like, hey, I use these sources for, these, for this care guide. If you want more information, go to one of these sources. And that's, it's getting beefed up because I want to make, uh, like you were mentioning earlier, I want Reptophiles to be as official and trustworthy as people need it to be. Well, I think you're, I mean, I, I love the sort of consistent logical flow that you have with your care guides. And, and, and like you said, like these are pages and pages for one animal, one species. So if anybody opens up a care guide and it's, you know, half a page long or a page long, you know, uh, it's missing something, you know, and there's all sorts of bizarre care guides out there. I mean, even the box, the box stores have like your four bullet point care guides and, and whatnot. So you need to be doing there. You should be reading several pages of information to, to get a, a rough idea of how to care for an animal. Yeah, I, I guess I meant to say this, but I didn't. Um, the resources like in total, what I usually pull from is I will go to Facebook groups, as I mentioned on forums, but I will also look through scientific research papers. Google Scholar is great, as well as Germany is really full of great animal information. Um, so Google Germany, anybody? Uh, local climate data, that's a little difficult, but always a good way to establish baselines for humidity and air temperature at midday. Um, and getting averages, like how uh, seasonal fluctuations and how that might affect the animal uh, for seasonal cooling. Um, I will talk to breeders if I can, or visit their websites. Breeders usually have care information, or at least the good ones. Um, and it's always good to see their perspective. They usually don't have the best husbandry, but they know what works. Um, care sheets. I will totally read all of the care sheets from the ones that were just written because they're an Amazon affiliate and they want to sell stuff. And the information is so bad, it makes you want to puke. Uh, to pretty good care guides like anapsid.org that were written by Melissa Kaplan. She's one of my, she's really inspired my journey in Reptophiles. And even though it's out of date, it's still good. So I just pull it all together. iNaturalist, field guides, so, so valuable. Uh, my rough scaled plated lizard, I'm also working on a care guide on them that should be out shortly. And there's not a lot of information on them. Field guides have been invaluable to figuring out what I'm actually dealing with here. Is this a basically a bearded dragon in another body or it, are there essential differences that we need to pay attention to? And so even a short entry in a field guide can make a world of difference for helping me sift through the good from the bad. Um, and books, I do try to read books when I can. I'll hit discount bookstores 
and just like flip through their reptile books and be like, so do you have anything good here? And more often than not, I will walk out of that store with some books and put them on my shelf. Also, uh, general reptile husbandry books, like the ones by Arcadia Reptile and John Courtney Smith, are so good. Uh, one of his most recent books, uh, Fire the Sun and Its Repli Replication in Captivity, is, and that's not the exact title, it's just called Fire. And it is fire. The information is so good, and it really revolutionized my perspective on lighting reptiles and how to do it and how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually had John on the show. The episode will be re released this week, and so it'll be the episode that's released before your episode. Uh, he is he is brilliant. Like he is insanely smart, and and I had the same reaction with his stuff. Like wow, I need, there's so much more I should be doing. And, and the lighting stuff has been really, really interesting. So he's a fantastic resource for anybody that's looking for sort of dig deeper into, into care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you think that, I know that in Europe and Germany, like they have some more restrictive care or they have sort of um, almost rules and guidelines that you have to follow. Do you think that's something that should be here in North America or or do you think just promoting proper care through something like Reptifiles can get in front of this? Because obviously we do have an issue with poor care. Not everybody, I mean, everyone gets mad. I, I take good care of my animals. Yes, I know a lot of people do take good care of their animals, but there are a lot of people that, you know, animals are probably only living like 30 to 40% of their lifespan. And is there anything that can be done about that? There are a lot of factors in the system right now that make that very complicated. And the United States is an enormous country. Um, a lot of the countries in Europe is, are as big as our states. Right. Uh, and it makes enforcement very difficult on a wide scale. Um, I think it's it would be beneficial to add some kind of standard, something at least, which is something we do not have. Um, some countries, uh, I cannot remember which one I got this idea from. They actually like require you to pass like a reptile keeping certification to have a pet reptile. And that would be awesome. It'd be really awesome for people like me because I'm a reptile educator and I can get a little bit of side income uh, doing that. But also it would help give, it would require people to pass a baseline of education to care for their animal. And regardless of how well they listen, it's going to be somewhere in their brain and that will make a difference. Um, then we've got to talk about chain pet stores. Pet stores got to make money and it, people impulse buy animals all the time. You see it at Petco, you see it at PetSmart, you see it at Reptile Expos. Should we shut these down? No. There's no reason to shut them down. Petco and PetSmart are often the only source of reptile supplies for a lot of people. The internet makes things better, but a lot of people don't realize that they can shop on the internet or they would rather shop for something that is in their hands and they're on the same day or they're in a rush because they're heat bulb blue etc and etc so i don't think the solution is shutting them down entirely or saying you should just take your hands off exotic pets forever blah. i don't think they should be selling animals um especially the more common ones actually like bearded dragons leopard geckos ball pythons corn snakes these animals are commonly uh, impulse purchased and you find them in rescues or dead a few months later So, restricting the sales there would help or better idea how about the only animals you can buy in the pet store are adoptable from rescues there's a lot of unwanted animals we can recycle them that's a terrible way to put it but it's true. Um, we can help them find new homes, and a pet store will be one of the best places to do it. Right now, some pet stores have adoption events, and those always go great. Reptile expos. You have a rescue that puts up a table and has their adoptables ready. They get adopted. People want them. It's taking a bad situation and making the best of it. Totally. So obviously, there's like you were talking about. There's tons of folklore, myths, and husbandry bizarre things that people are doing in in the pet trade and 
what are some of the most common errors and common husbandry myths that you see that sort of perpetuate in, in the hobby? Well, when I wrote a list, I would it's quite long. Come up with this an entire freaking page <laughs> in five minutes less. Um, there's a lot. Some of the most common ones that I see are um, not using a natural basking surface when they're using a temperature gun makes a big difference. Temperature guns are used by researchers in the field to determine what temperature an animal is basking at, what, sur what temperature is the surface of the stone at, what temperature is the surface of the animal at. If you are using a plastic basking surface or a hammock, it is not going to be able to absorb and reflect heat in the same way, and so you might get a different, possibly dangerous result. Um, more common things, okay, claiming that loose substrate causes impaction, it does not. Loose substrate is fine. It is everywhere and all over this earth. The problem is, if you are concerned about impaction, make sure the other factors of your husbandry are on point. Make sure the temperatures are high enough. Underheating of reptiles is very common. Most reptiles need temperatures 10 to 20 degrees higher than you think that they do. Um, and temperature gradient. Make sure that the enclosure is large enough to accommodate that high temperature too so that they can get away with it or get away from it, not with it. I can get away with it. Um, <laughs> make sure that uh, they're adequately hydrated as well. A, a dehydrated reptile will get impacted because their organs can't function properly. There's not enough water to help things digest. and Make sure you're actually using a loose substrate that they were built to digest. Like wood chips on a sandfish skink? No. But fine dune sand, most of their feces actually in the wild is sand. They ingest a lot of it and they pass it just fine. Or, uh, let's see. Honestly, wood chips are a big problem. They're just too big. Most are not ingested. Um, artificial substrates. I had a case when I was just starting out with reptophiles where someone asked me about a artificial leaf that their snake had ingested and it eventually killed the snake. Yeah, it was very sad. Um, making sure that their systems are built to handle what you have in their environment is huge when it comes to preventing impaction. Natural, cheap substrates like organic topsoil peat moss, natural dune sand, great substrates, and most likely not gonna harm a reptile. Uh, let's see, other problems. That one covered quite a few of them. Overfeeding snakes. Oh my gosh, there are so many obese snakes and lizards, but mostly snakes because people can't tell. Like it is only when they become morbidly obese and Helen Cairo does amazing work with obese snake awareness. I love her work as a vet tech. All of the exploratory surgeries that she does and puts on YouTube, like, it really opened my eyes to this problem and how wide. Sorry, can you say her name one more time? I think I, I talked when you said it. and <laughs> That's okay. Her name is Helen Cairo. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll definitely put that in the show notes for people to find. K-A-I-R-O. Okay, perfect. It's yeah, she's just an amazing resource. I love her to death and she's got this quirky sense of humor and this cute little art style that I absolutely adore. Awesome. Um superworms as regular feeders. I brought that up earlier. Uh using really fatty sources of food um as a regular thing. People think, "Oh, it's just a bug. Like what's the difference?" No, just like you look at the nutrition the, the nutrition facts on your food, you got to look at the nutrition facts on your reptile's food and adjust accordingly. A high fat diet is rarely healthy for anyone unless you're on a keto diet and that is very special circumstances and not healthy long term. Um, oh, what else? So much to cover. Ooh, ball pythons. Very common not giving them enough space. Minimum enclosure size for an adult ball python is four by two by two. Some are more active than others, particularly male ball pythons may need more space despite the fact that they're smaller. Um, they do a lot of climbing and cruising because they spend a lot of time in trees in the wild. So they have those instincts to climb and to cruise. They're looking for females. They're looking for food you need to give them enough space to accommodate that. So now we see, you know, a lot of ball pythons and other snakes in racks. Sorry to bring up that, but 
tiny, tiny spaces with no enrichment, no UVB, no temperature gradient. They get so fat. They become these blobs, these brainless, just blobs that sit there. They don't, they're not even reptiles anymore. They're just a stuffed animal that occasionally moves and eats. Like that is not a reptile and it is not how they should be kept. Uh, sparse enclosures as well. Pimp it out. Decor is one of the most expensive aspects of setting up an enclosure and I absolutely hate it. I don't want to think about how much I spent when I revamped my ball pythons enclosure, <laughs> but it looks great and she uses it. She's got options for when she cruises and I love seeing her use it. Uh, night heat is another big one. Most reptiles do not need heat at night. Um, unless your house gets very cold, um, depending on the species, some tolerate only as low as about 70, 65 degrees. Others tolerate all the way down to 50. Um, bearded dragons, for example. When in doubt, don't use night heat and your animal will be fine. In fact, better because they will be cold in the morning and motivated to bask. And when they move to bask, they are able to fully recharge and they will be more active and more metabolically healthy for the rest of their life. Uh, colored bulbs are the last thing I want to touch on. Colored bulbs are not good. Aside from like the less severe effects of using a red bulb turns everything they see red, which is weird for them and may have some psychological implications that we don't fully understand yet. Um, you've got blue daytime bulbs that are advertised. These are not healthy. Daylight is white. And blue bulbs will damage an animal's eyesight. It damages a reptile's eyesight and the blue light that is emitted from our devices, our screens, damages our own eyesight. So we really have to avoid those colored bulbs at all costs. And incidentally, they're usually used for night heat. So again, stop using the colored bulbs and the night. Heat. Yeah, you can kill two birds with one stone there. Exactly. And, and there's actually now after reading, you know, John's work, the, the amount of UVB that we should be using is way more than happening in the hobby right now. I know that you provide UVB for, for all your animals, I think, it's, right? Um, a few still need upgrades. Um, I'm, it's been a slow process of getting my entire collection up to speed. Yes, me too. Well, it's expensive, but it's the good thing about reptiles is we can grow and you can sort of add as you as you can. Um but yeah, I think the end goal is to have UVB everywhere. And that's what my goal is anyway. Yes. And all of my care guides recommend strongly UVB. It's a common argument I get into with blue tongue skinks, for example. That's a real can of worms. They've been bred for a long time, kept very successfully without UVB. Doesn't mean they don't necessarily need it to truly thrive. Exactly. Tell me about your reptile starter kits. I know, or your reptile star starter kits. I know that's something that you're working on right now, and it seems really interesting. And it's one of the areas that I think will be super helpful for for newcomers. Yeah, and you are not the only one. This is one of the most common questions I get: is the starter kits. And yeah. honestly, the only reason I haven't really proceeded is lack of time. I have been incredibly busy. Uh, this. If anyone wants to pay me to do this full time, please let me know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I will be able to pump things out much faster than before. It's right now it's just kind of squeezed with the cracks. So right now, starter kits, as I've written in my previous blog post about them, they're notorious for promoting poor husbandry in exchange for a cheap price tag. Um, so after writing that article, I really realized how big of a problem this was. And so I started looking for a solution. Um, certain manufacturers, there are a few, I will say this, that do a good job of providing kits. Um, Custom Reptile Enclosures is a brand new manufacturer and their, their starter kits are looking amazing, but they're very new. It'll take a little while for them to get like full scale production for a variety of species but they're definitely someone to keep an eye on. Um, for the most part, it's up to the people themselves to put together their own kit. And up until this point, I've just been giving people shopping lists of like, make sure you have a UVB bulb, make sure of like this strength, make sure you have the, the, the. But as people have been talking to me and as I've been interacting more, I've become more aware that that's not good enough. They need specific product recommendations for every scenario. So. Um, what I'm doing with the starter kits is uh, something that isn't actually what most people think of as a starter kit. 
It's more of a hybrid between a starter kit and a shopping list. Uh, a Reptifiles approved starter kit is very expensive total, and most people do not have the, uh, the available income to buy one of those off the bat, even if it were broken up into payment plans. Also, I don't favor one manufacturer above the rest. I'm Reptifiles is an unbiased source of information, so I pull from different manufacturers. Some are definitely better than others and have tested more often uh, better than their competition, but I cannot favor anyone over the others. So I have to work across brands, and that has made working with people a little bit difficult. So the solution is put the power in the keeper's hands. The shopping lists are going to be uh, itemized. They're going to be visual so that you can just click and it will take you exactly to the place with the exact um, like specs, st uh, brand, strength, wattage, whatever, size that you need. You can buy it, an instant peace of mind. And if you have enough money to buy it all at once, great. If you don't have enough money to buy it all at once, not a problem. Buy it piece by piece. And this flexibility will really help enable people who want to do a good job but have limited income. Um, it's, I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's going to be a one size fits all kind of sit, uh, situation too because I'm going to be basing these uh, starter kits not on age but rather what would fit an adult animal, which is a little controversial because a lot of people are like, ah, no, the baby's gotta be kept in the smaller enclosures and that. It's true, they do struggle in full-size enclosures sometimes, but here's the thing, nature isn't 12, 12, 18. Nature is huge. And if they can survive in the nature to adulthood in all of its hugeness, if we set up the large enclosure appropriately for the baby's needs, which honestly is usually appropriate for the adult's needs as well, with a couple of alterations, then you'll be fine. So for example, um, a crested gecko kit. Crested geckos are very commonly one of those species where it's like, okay, keep them in a critter keeper until they're about like 12 to 15 grams, and then you can upgrade them to a larger enclosure. No, I wanna start with the 18 by 18 by 24, the minimum recommended adult size, and well, the minimum reptifiles recommended adult size, that's not consistent everywhere. And say, okay, whether you have a baby or not, like if you have a baby, you might need a couple of extra food stands and a couple of extra places for them to hide. But we're gonna do everything from the UVB to the heat lamp to the substrate, everything you need a couple clicks away. And that is going to be the Reptifile starter kit. Well, I think that's really awesome. And and even I, I like the idea of going after the adult animal because the other really terrible thing, or should, maybe not terrible, but the bad thing that happens in the hobby is people buy a small animal and they set it up for the baby and they don't actually expense out what it's going to cost them when, when the animal's an adult. Do they have space? Can they afford an adult enclosure? So even just exposing them to the expense of what this animal is going to need in a year, because it only takes these animals a year or two, a lot of time to get, you know, almost adult size is really important. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not very uh, efficient with your money either, because you have to buy, uh, depending on what guide you're reading, you might have to buy several different sizes of enclosure as it gets bigger, which is absolutely totally. ludicrous, especially when you're paying hundreds of dollars for an enclosure. Start with the most expensive one. Sure, it's a really steep uh, like price from the get-go, but it will save you so much money over time, and the animal will actually be happy. And, you know, just like you said, you have a better idea of what you're getting into. Um, and it exactly. prevents some people from getting the reptile because it's not exactly something that they can care for. Or they realize, oh, I didn't realize it took that. Then, you know, that's kind of a victory. I want people to be able to enjoy their pets and do what they love. But I want them to be able to do it in a way that they can have a clear conscience. Totally. And, you know, uh, people always get a little mad when I bring up regulations and whatnot. And I, I don't know if I personally would want 
government regulations because that usually is people who don't know anything about the animals who are creating rules and, and that sort of sucks for everybody. But someone like yourself who it, I, I think it needs to come from the hobby. These standards and regulations need to come from the hobby. And if we have gold standards and sort of authority figures that are giving proper information, then we can take care of all that on our own because then people who are not part of the hobby can can look at the hobby and see, okay, this is not bad. These animals are in good condition. But if we don't do that, then someone's going to step in and make peculiar rules that have nothing to do with animal care because they're just trying to stop, you know, animals from suffering and whatnot. So I think what you're doing is 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 awesome. And I, I think, the, you know, you're going to be, that's, Reptifiles is a step towards standardizing things from within the hobby, which is super important. I sure hope so. Can you let everybody know where they can find you, Reptifiles and whatnot? So, Reptifiles, uh, you can see on the shirt, that's our name. It's Reptile Files. Even if you Google Reptile Files, I will come up. Awesome. Um, so, when you can't remember, just think of that. Um, spelling, R-E-P-T-I-F-I-L-E-S. Um, and we have, obviously, Reptifiles.com, the website, we also have an Instagram account, same name. Uh, that's where I do some educating and share pictures of my own collection as well as my own day-to-day -day insights, my adventures. So if you want that personal touch, that's the place to go. And we're also on Facebook. Uh, there I usually share kind of just like a reptile of the day, something that looks cool as well as articles that my friends are writing, extra reading that I think is really interesting or talk a little bit about current issues. Um, we're looking towards starting a YouTube account, um, hopefully later this year. Got a few logistical things to work through, but look to that in the future as well. Awesome. Well, I uh, really appreciate you coming on. I, it was a pleasure chatting with you, and I'm, it's, it's great to talk with someone who's such a great ambassador for the hobby. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, that is the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening. I do really hope you enjoyed that conversation. And Mariah, if you're listening to this, thank you so much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. I will include everything in the show notes that Mariah mentioned in the episode. She did mention a bunch of different sources where she gets information and whatnot, and that will all be in the show notes, so it's very easily found. And definitely go check out Repti Files if you haven't yet. She's got tons of information on that website, and it's constantly in a state of development. And, and like I said at the beginning, I think tackling the problem of misinformation on the internet is a serious pr problem and it's a huge problem so the fact that she's doing that and she's really working and striving to correct some of these folklore and just poor information is is really commendable because in a lot of ways it does seem like it could be a losing battle just because of the magnitude of bad information up there so that's why it's so important that we do support projects like Reptifiles this is the step in the right direction for the hobby if you are enjoying the show, again, a five-star rating on the Apple iTunes or podcasting app is hugely appreciated. And if you want to go check out animalsathome.ca slash shop, you can find a, any shirts or sweaters there. $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And again, if you are in the market for a canyon-style reptile decor, definitely go check out customreptilehabitats.com. Check out the Rocky Canyon reptile decor kit there's some seriously nice materials in there nice products and again animals at home coupon code will give you a free bag of sphagnum moss i will talk to you guys next time